Good morning, afternoon or night, depending on when you're watching this. My name is Leo Alves, I'm from UFF. I'm here to talk about my work on addressing overfitting issues in Cindy. This has been sponsored by CNPQ, also the US Air Force, and it's been doing in collaboration. This work has been done in collaboration with uh, some folks at uh, the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department at UCLA. So, um, in general, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the use of Cindy for model development. Right? Model development has been traditionally done, as, as it's known in science, modern science, from first principles. This is what's been proposed by Galileo from the beginning. Um, this is what, for instance, what, as everybody knows, Isaac Newton has done when he developed his uh, laws of motion from first principles using calculus and his experiments. Uh, but this can also be done uh, uh, using uh, through uh, database approaches. And uh, this is nothing new. Uh, Johann Kepler did that, uh, which is a contemporary of the previous two people I mentioned. And when he developed his uh, laws of planetary motion using data from the planet orbits that he collected using his uh, telescopes. And we, so what we're going to focus on is on the use of machine learning to do that. And we're going to focus on a specific aspect of machine learning that is known as symbolic regression, which is nothing but the use of regression analysis uh, to search for models that best fit uh, the, the available data. And uh, so to mention uh, a few uh, work, a few papers on symbolic regression that really has brought it to the forefront of machine learning uh, is the work of uh, Lipson and co-workers. Uh, in which they use genetic programming to identify these uh, nonlinear differential equations that model data. And uh, more recently, there's been the work of Brunton, Proctor, and Cutts um, using uh, ideas of compressed sensing and sparse regression uh, to be able to do the same, but based on linear regression. There's a lot of more work uh, based on uh, the stuff that these guys have done, but I'm just citing here the main papers the original papers in which they developed those. But, uh, so we're gonna focus on this work on Cindy and, uh, and specific issues associated with each, which is the convergence problems that you have with it. And they, they happen usually when you try to increase the nonlinearity order of your system. They also happen when uh, you increase the vector state size in your system. And so we're gonna try to address those issues here. Um, so basically we assume that you have some data that is like a compressed data set that represents your problem right that compressed data can be compressing the data can be done in different ways um, for instance with projection methods like Kalerkin, you can use principal component analysis or for instance like pop orthogonal decomposition dynamic mode decomposition there's a, there's a number of ways in which you can do that and then you can build a system of equations like that in which you have your state vector size and you have your state function and so Cindy, there's a few assumptions behind it. And the main one is that your uh, state vector uh, size is arbitrary, but it's small, right? So n is arbitrary, but small. And you know the time history in your data, so you know the, how these guys vary with time. And you assume that whatever dependence f has on your state vector x, um, is, 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 although it's not known, is very sparse. For instance, F1 depends only on X1 and X2, but not on the others and so on. So Cindy, the way, the first thing you do is you define a sampling rate M and a sampling period tau, and um, which is, you know, depends on the initial and final times that you use to, that you extract your data from. Um, then you build your matrices and you can, you have your state size, state vector, and then you evaluate it at the different times for which you have that data and you build that matrix. But what you really need is a derivative, time derivative of that data. And you can either measure that directly or approximate it numerically from the original data that you have. Um, then you build your library of candidate functions. And the way you do that is, is, is usually is a polynomial representation uh, using a monomial basis, which is nothing but a power series. You can see here you have one X, x squared and so on, right? And, and in all possible combinations, for instance, quadratic terms not only have to be x1 squared, but also x1 times x2 and so on. And you do that up to whatever order that you want to use uh, that we call the highest value of which we call p. 
and that will give you a, a possibility of terms that you can combine to fit your data that having Q terms and then you, of course you're going to have coefficients that are going to be in front of each one of these terms that you use to create your coefficient matrix right then you can propose transform that nonlinear uh, ordinary differential equations that we talked about before which is here you can transform that based on these matrices on like an algebraic system and uh, you can do that for each lines in your coefficient matrix or your uh, uh, the state vector derivative matrix and you solve it in stages and of course and you do linear regression to find out which coefficients you need to put in front of which these terms in order to fit the data for x dot and you do that uh, also but to do that uh, of course you need an objective function to minimize and in this case it's essentially the left hand side minus the right hand side and we included here some regularization and in this case the specific one is lasso which is a well-known one that is nice because it, it, take, it removes terms that it deems unnecessary automatically for you uh, so the test cases that we're going to use are going to be non the Lorentz equations interesting thing about it is that the control parameters appear only on the linear terms in each equation a sigma rho and beta and these equations that the maximum nonlinearity order in them is quadratic right you have x times z and x times y here there are three typical scenarios that we can analyze one is a chaotic regime the, the values of the parameters to get those the ones that we used here at least uh, given here so you can see like a broad band of frequency spectra here and uh, that explains the, the time series behavior that you see on the left and uh, there's a double periodic regime in which you get two dominant uh, frequencies in your spectrum the corresponding time series is on the left and there's a periodic regime when you have a single dominant frequency that controls the behavior um, so uh, of course i'm talking about here asymptotic behavior so for very large times so you have, you're ignoring the data for the early times in which you can have linear growth of disturbances and whatever transient behavior before you reach these asymptotic trends that i just showed um, so the, the first results we're going to look into is without regularization. We're going to look at the values of the three main parameters that we increase the nonlinearity order. And I need to note here that one doesn't mean linear approximation. It just means like that I'm using an inverse problem type of approach in which I feed to my library of candidate functions exactly the same terms that appear in the Lorentz equations, although the coefficients in the parameters in front of each one are not yet known. And, and so as it increase the nonlinearity order, we can see that we have a lot of error propagation. These results in the first line are bang on, like of course, no machine precision accuracy uh, with the ones used to generate the data, but as I increase the nonlinearity order, the, uh, there's a lot of error propagation and the coefficients become very, very wrong. And also not only that, I'm illustrating here the case of the fifth order ones we have this has been normalized by the highest coefficient which you can see is the one multiplying x in the equation for i which is exactly rho um, so that's why the maximum one is one here and you can see there's a lot of terms that appear in your equation that should be zero but are there you, although even for instance the high order ones are small nothing is telling you really that it doesn't exist and it's supposed to be small or if it shouldn't exist at all so this is the reason why people use lasso regularization because it knocks off those terms and it does a pretty good job of eliminating most of those terms but still you still have unphysical terms in in whatever model that you get back independent of whatever value you use for the regularization parameter this has been done in the previous case for the w periodic case that's why rho is 165 and in here for rho equals 28 is the chaotic case but a similar trend happens for all three cases so then we move on to looking into the uh, how the relative error behaves and also associate with the condition number of the library of the matrix of the library of candidate functions and uh, we can see that uh, if we increase the, the sampling rate after a certain point it does nothing to change the condition number of our matrix and it doesn't do anything to reduce the, the relative error either um, also if we increase the period uh, the sampling period after it does decrease the condition number and the error but after a certain point it doesn't improve the results any further 
So you can tell that the condition number is a pretty good proxy for the behavior of the relative error, which is a very good thing because in this particular case, we generated our data from the Lawrence equation, so we know the exact solution. But in general, we do not, so it, it, we can't you really calculate this guy. So knowing that the condition number, which you can calculate for any problem, is a good proxy for this behavior is a good thing. Just noting that for very small sampling, uh, uh, sampling rates, the condition number decreases because the matrix size decreases. But uh, we don't have enough data to create a proper model for our data. That's why the error is still large. So if you understand that, then you can use the condition number as a proxy for your relative error. And in this last plot, you can summarize uh, our results. And we show that as we increase the nonlinearity order, um, the condition number of the matrix of associated with the library of candidate functions increases, which means there's more error propagation, which is why the relative error also increases. A less intuitive thing is that uh, the chaotic condition is the one that produces the smallest uh, condition numbers, although it still increases with the nonlinearity order, and also uh, largest errors, the smallest errors which is sort of counterintuitive, but if you understand that um, the fact that the solution is chaotic probably moves that matrix towards more of our, like a, its elements having a random distribution of values, and we know that, matrix that uh, matrices that are generated with, uh, whose elements are generated randomly, they have very small condition numbers, you can prove that. So maybe by, by being a chaotic behavior, or moving towards that scenario, that's why the condition number decreases. And also, a way to approximately calculate the condition number is the ratio between largest and smaller, smallest eigenvalues. And as you go to periodic and double periodic conditions, the eigenvalues move away from the unit circle, so that ratio becomes larger, which is probably why the condition number also increases in those cases. So to summarize, um, it turns out the library of candidate functions it has a van der Mond structure, right? And van der Mond matrices are known to be U-conditioned. And uh, the condition number of those matrices actually increases as the size of the matrix increases. And by increasing the nonlinearity order, uh, and we haven't done that, but by, by proxy, by increasing the state vector size, we increase the size of that matrix. And then as a result, we're going to have larger matrix. Larger matrix means more U-conditioning because it's a van der Mond uh, type matrix, so we are going to have more error propagation. And so which limits our ability to use CND. The reason why these things happen is because uh, we have chosen a monomial basis for our polynomial representation. And um, so as a next, that's why it has a van der Mond type of structure. It's, it's a well-known fact from interpolation theory and numerical analysis. So the next step moving forward is to try to use a different basis and we are currently trying orthogonal basis to represent our unknown system to try to overcome this issue and minimize error propagation. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please place it in the chat and I'll get back to you. Thank you so much and take care.